Good morning and welcome to the Utilico Emerging Markets Trust PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. You can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just click Q&A, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Charles Jennings, Investment Manager. Good morning. Good morning, Paul, and thank you for the introduction. Um, morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Utilico Emerging Markets. Um, we're going to spend the next 45 minutes probably talking about uh, the fund and, and how we operate and run it. Um, I hope you enjoy the presentation. I'm joined today by three um, senior analysts who look after the sectors and two of which also help me look after the portfolio. So running through the presentation that we have prepared for you, um, overview of UEM, you know, it's an attractive long-term investment opportunity. So the investment objective we set is to provide a long-term total return by investing predominantly in infrastructure, digitalization, utility, and related sectors in the emerging markets. And to just give you some color, when we say infrastructure, we would mean things like ports, airports, railway. Um, we would not mean airlines or shipping lines. So we're, we like the nature of the long-term fundamental infrastructure asset. Um, background, we were established in 2005, listed on the London Stock Exchange. We are a closed-end investment trust, so we can take those long-term investments um, and we are managed by a company called ICM and ICM Investment Management Limited. Our investment approach, um, we're a relentless bottom-up investment uh, uh, approach. Um, we're constantly looking for compelling um, investments. We think our portfolio offers a, a high conviction diversified portfolio predominantly operational assets. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean that the, the in businesses in which we invest um, and over 90% are listed um, and probably over 95% are operational, i.e. they're up and running, um, running an airport, running a port, and we can therefore assess the opportunity both from its location but also the management team. We, we look for long-term assets. Um, most of them have an established regulatory framework, um, which provides us with a, a reasonable degree of predictability, um, but also sustainable growth, because we can look out um, through um, investment cycles. We've got a proven management team. Um, I've been the portfolio manager since 2005, inception of the fund. Um, the three uh, colleagues joining me today um, as, as a combined group, we have over 100 years of experience, um, most of it um, with UEM. Um, so I think we've, we've got a very stable and, 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 and good team that understands the sector well. One point I would emphasize, we travel extensively. Um, we feel there's nothing more, better than visiting an investee company. You know, if you if you visit a port, you can see is it tidy, has it got capacity, um, are the links to it good, um, or is it constrained by some factor that isn't evident when you're just reading numbers. Um, so we do travel and and visit, and that that is part of our approach. Um, over time, uh, since inception, we've delivered 9.3% annualized total return, um, and we're currently delivering a yield or 3.9%. 3, 3 if I look at the team in a little bit more detail, um, and here today, Jacqueline Boers looks after transport, uh, Jonathan Grucock looks after utilities, Mark LaBelle looks after digital infrastructure, and you'll hear from them later. Um, but other members of our team, Eduardo Greca, based in Brazil, clearly looks after Brazil, but he also gives us a very good insight into Latin America. Um, he's been with us uh, uh, over 10 years. George Velikov, um, 
based in London, um, but he's Eastern European and clearly gives us a lot of insight into Eastern Europe, um, which is especially um, um, uh, valuable at the moment. Henry, our latest recruit, um, is is an analyst and, 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 and learning. And Gillian, based in London, is um, a, a Chinese speaker and gives us that capability, therefore, to look at um, the data and the information coming out of China and challenge what we're hearing. Um, so strong team, diversified, um, and I think capable of, of finding those compelling investments. I would note that as a wider group, we have over 70 staff worldwide. We have 10 officers um, ranging from Sydney through to Brazil. Um, and within that staff number, we have 20 specialists, um, including country and other sector experts that we can draw on. So a lot of strength in terms of the group and, and, and what we offer. So the question we get is why invest in emerging markets? Um, it, they offer high economic growth um, coupled with attractive secular dynamics. Now, what do we mean by the, that? Secular dynamic, dynamics, there continues to be a growth of the middle class um, and therefore an increase in consumption. And there continues to be a, a move to urbanization. And there continues to be investment in infrastructure. And those three themes, if you looked at places like Brazil, India, China, they ought to drive opportunities for our portfolio, given its positioning of meeting the needs, if you want, of consumption, urbanization, um, and infrastructure investment. The emerging markets generate 60% of the global economic growth. Um, and while there are from time to time challenges on individual markets as a group, they do move forward over time and therefore a strong backlog for investments. Market diversification. One of the things that we can look to as a long-term investor is the opportunity to outvalue over time, over an economic cycle, over a political cycle, or over a business cycle. Um, and as such, we can take a, a, an investment today in difficult markets, but look through to two, three, four years when things ought to be fairer and the opportunity to be outed in terms of value. Um, there are lots of market inefficiencies, as you would anticipate. Um, a number of our companies are not that well covered. Um, and certainly within the international um, uh, investment trust sector, um, the types of investments that we seek out are very often not in others' portfolios. Um, and as such, there can very often be uh, inefficiencies in market pricing. And we can bring our understanding of value in one market um, to a new opportunity and determine wh whether there is deep value there. Yes, there's high off, uh, volatility often, um, but I look at it as offering us a entry point um, that's attractive. Um, you know, I look at the challenges we're facing at the moment in terms of volatility as an opportunity to buy for the medium to long term. I'd note at the moment that in terms of valuations, they are depressed. A um, number of our companies, most of them for that matter, are producing improving earnings, improving financial metrics, but their valuation, their price, share price has gone backwards. And as such, their valuations have reduced and, and, and therefore attractive. Um, given our network and, and infrastructure, we have access to uh, uh, all the emerging markets. Um, and there is certainly enough liquidity for us to buy and sell. Um, should we see opportunities, we're able to execute them. So I think you'll agree, I hope, that the emerging markets is a good place to look for investments. I'll now hand over to John, who will talk through uh, YUEM. John. So why invest in UEM? 
Well, firstly, there's a strong investment team. We're experienced, we're a dedicated team, and we have very specialized knowledge. And, and why is that important? Well, emerging markets by their very nature are less developed than the UK or Europe. We're not just talking about economic development, we're talking about reporting standards, regulatory environments, corporate governance, politics. All of these require detailed and intricate analysis. What we have at ICM is an accumulation of decades of knowledge relating to all of the factors. Whilst COVID has temporarily impacted travel, as Charles mentioned, we do go out to these companies and we're not just going to the head office, meeting the chief executive and the chief financial officer. We're going to visit the port. We're going to drive on the toll road and we're going to see the wind farm in action. We're going to talk to the local operating managers. We're going to talk to the engineers. We're going to get an understanding of the challenges that they face and what they see the opportunities as being. And we get a very good sense of what kind of operators those businesses are. How good are they? Are they quality? And what are we looking to invest in? <clears throat> Utilities and infrastructure. Um, Charles Hyler, ports, airports, toll roads, gas utilities, water utilities, electricity utilities, data infrastructure such as data centers. So we're looking for businesses which are monopolistic in nature with very high barriers to entry. We want long-term assets and we're talking about assets which could last for over 50 years in, if you're talking about a hydroelectric dam, electricity transmission lines. Wind and solar farms will last over 20 years. And the transport hubs, well, they're probably gonna be essential infrastructure for a country right through to the next century. So critical to these assets is the regulatory environment. That determines what the returns will be for us as investors on these long duration assets. And so we're looking for those assets in those countries which have well-established and properly implemented regulation. It's important to note that these regulatory frameworks often have inflation adjustment explicitly embedded within their contracts so in the present environment, that inflation projection is a highly attractive attribute. For UEM, the combination of a well-managed, good long-term asset, a robust regulatory environment, should deliver predictable and stable cash flows to our investee companies and ultimately to UEM and its investors. On investment approach, as we said, we're looking for assets predominantly operational and cash generative and offer high operating leverage. Taking a toll road as an example, once the very substantial initial capital outlay is made for the road, the ongoing operational expenses are relatively small and each additional car or lorry that drives on the road and pays a fee, that fee should drop right through to earnings. We're bottom up focused. We're actively seeking out best-in-class management teams running resilient cash generative assets. We're focused on the companies in emerging markets, which give those highest prospective risk and return metrics. We're not just looking for a particular geography or index. We're very actively engaging with the management teams and not just at the inception of an investment, but throughout the whole life cycle and often beyond disinvestment, we will stay in touch with teams to understand how they are doing and to understand how the competitive environment moves on. For many of these companies, we've, we've built up relationships over many, many years. And these relationships are often unparalleled for any other foreign investor. And that gives us a voice, a voice to hold management to account to improve and guide corporate governance and to maximize shareholder returns. And one area which we have been very active on is the development of proper ESG reporting in our investee companies. ESG is only really starting to be implemented in many emerging markets. And we have a proprietary ESG framework embedded in our investment process. And that framework gives us a clear scoring metrics and identifies areas of improvement 
which we can then highlight to management teams. And we see this as a very powerful tool for enhancing the shareholder returns by reducing the risks relating not just to governance, but to issues relating to climate change. When it comes to portfolio construction, we've got a flexible approach. We're high conviction investors and we're benchmark agnostic. Unlike many funds, we're not simply taking a benchmark and then over or under weighting constituents. We're entirely bottom up. We're, we're choosing what we believe are the best opportunities at the time. We're not just buying Samsung because it happens to be a heavyweight in the EM index. And this means that we have a very high active share of almost 99%. So very little direct overlap with the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. And as an example, in May, the MSCI Emerging Markets had 31% of its portfolio in China and 16% in Taiwan. UEM, we only have 17% in China and nothing in Taiwan. And it's the same with sector exposure. 22% of MSCI Emerging Markets is financials. We have no financials. And by not being benchmark focused, we can also invest in smaller mid cap companies, which as Charles alluded to, are often overlooked because the brokers don't cover them. The investors are not interested in them because they don't have particular relevance to their benchmark. And finally, UEM is a closed end investment fund. This means that the pool of capital that we manage is committed for the long term. And we can take a correspondingly long term view on our investments. And we're typically evaluating these investments on a five year horizon, not just next quarter's earnings. So what does this all mean? Well, if you turn to page five, you can see that we've delivered NAV compound annual return of 9.3% in sterling. And that's as after all costs since inception 17 years ago. For comparison, the MSCI Emerging Markets Index is up 7.9% compound. So UEM has outperformed strongly over the long term. A couple of <clears throat> other things to notice from this chart. Firstly, whilst we do have a high active share, the investee share uh, prices are not immune to short-term fluctuations in the market. However, as Charles said, when there is volatility, we can take advantage to it. Secondly, the red line indicates UEM's share price. Now note there's a gap between that and the blue line, which is an NAV per share. This gap is a discount at which shareholders can buy UEM's portfolio. And today this stands at around 12%. As managers, we're targeting a discount of 10%. And over the past 17 years have affected buybacks totaling 122 million pounds to take advantage of this discount. Turning to the next slide, we wanted to highlight another very attractive quality for UEM, it's dividend. UEM plays dividends quarterly, and we have a very strong track record of progressively growing this dividend since inception. At the current share price, the dividend yield equates to 3.9%, which is a premium to the MSCI emerging markets and a premium to the majority of our comparable peer funds. Importantly, it's worth noting this dividend is fully covered by the income generated from dividends paid by our investee companies up to UEM rather than coming from reserves. Over 75% of the investee companies in the portfolio pay a dividend. So we have a high degree of certainty over the sustainability of payouts to the UEM shareholders. On that note, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Jax to uh, take you through the next couple of slides. Brilliant, thanks, John. Um, so we know rough, we know about UEM and, and what it stands for. We know why we should invest in emerging markets, and uh, we also know why you should invest in UEM. So moving on now to how the portfolio is constructed. 
Um, as uh, Charles and John have both mentioned, we are sort of very much bottom up focused. Um, so therefore, when you look at the sector and geographical splits, they're much more an outcome of our investment approach rather than us targeting, you know, specific sectors. Also, as John mentioned, um, we are very much, um, you know, we don't benchmark to the MSCI Emerging Market Index. You know, we've got a very diverse portfolio, which helps us to mitigate risk. But also we've got, you know, for exposure to, for example, electricity, the electricity sector, which is mainly transmission companies of 18.1% and ports and logistics at 17.3%. Uh, whereas if you compare to the MSCI, MSCI Emerging Market Index, which as John said, you know, that's very much more financial and consumer sort of wet heavy sort of focus. So we are able to sort of mitigate risk um, that way. Also geographically, you know, we are highly exposed to well, exposed to Brazil at 19.2%, and also China is only 16.8%. Whereas again, it, compared to the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, uh, exposure there of China is is around uh, 31%. As we are bottom up, though, that's not to say that we do it. We ignore any sort of uh, country's macroeconomic or political factors, um, because these are also detrimental to uh, our investment. Um, detrimental to our investment process and also what we invest in. For example, uh, if, for, instance, for example, you know, we like uh, political or governments in position where they have stable or they are, um, they have stable or they have good respect for concession agreements such that, you know, when there's a new political party elected into power, they're not going to rip up that concession agreements, which is, for instance, like Brazil. Brazil, you know, we have seen sort of market volatility come through, but you know, typically they do respect concession agreements um, when they're there. Diversification as well is also we're able to sort of, you know, make sure we're diversified by the sort of um, position size that we take. No single investment will exceed roughly 10% of gross assets. And our, we have an internal limit as well for country exposure, which is uh, limited to 35%. We also have conviction. Um, in our portfolio. Yes, we may have approximately 80 positions uh, or 80 holdings in the portfolio, but the top 10 positions or top 10 investments constitutes roughly about 30% of our holdings and the top 30 is 66% of the total assets under management. So, you know, we do believe very much in the uh, the top positions in the, in the portfolio. We also are very opportunistic in our investment approach. Um, as John also mentioned, you know, we are able to invest in sort of, you know, different type of asset products. For instance, we mainly are investing in primary or well, primarily invest in equity products, but we're not restricted to this. We can invest in bonds, we can invest in convertibles and we can invest in other types of securities. That means that we can be very nimble in our approach. And if there's the uh, attractive investment opportunity, we can capitalize upon it. We also um, have a gearing facility in place, again, which we can use um, when we believe the time is right. At the moment, net gearing is about 3.1%. However, we will prudently gear up when the opportunity is right and the market presents itself in a position that we would like to uh, take on um, additional gearing. We are also able to um, um, sort of look at unquoted investments. Um, at the moment, uh, this sort of is, you know, we typically um, don't like to exceed 10%. But again, if the investment opportunity and the return is there, being attractive enough, we will be able to make that investment, which makes us quite unique and also um, very uh, able to capitalize on the best return for the shareholders. So if we then, you might be wondering what does our portfolio look like? So on the next slide, you can see here what the UEM top 20 looks like as at the 30th of June. This makes up about 51% of uh, our total assets under management. If you would like to know what our top 30 looks like, um, feel, um, we, do have a, we do disclose this on our fact sheets. But we believe, though, that the top 30 that we currently are holding offers um, a very attractive valuations with um, a very uh, attractive dividend yield. Um, again, we don't benchmark to the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, but if you uh, looked at the valuation of the top 30 for us at the moment on a PE trailing basis, then uh, that is our PE is around 11.1 uh, times versus the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, which is around 13.1 times. So we are, we, you know, we are offering value there. Um, we also um, have a, a very attractive yield on the top 30 at the moment. It's about 4.3%, again, compared to the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, which has about a yield of about 2.8%. Um, we believe, though, on average, our investments have exceeded our expectations. Typically, um, 
of you know the growth has been more than we've expected um, and valuations at the moment as Charles has mentioned are attractive and they are have reduced over time which makes um, many of our companies in the portfolio at the moment very attractive investment opportunities. So to bring this all a bit more into sort of reality I suppose and give a bit more colour on the portfolio and bring it bring it a bit more to life what do we you know let, we're just going to run through a few of the investments that we currently are holding. So the first one we're going to talk about is uh, ICT. ICT is our number one ho holding in the portfolio. Um, yeah, thanks, Charles. Uh, it's um, we own uh, four, well, it, it makes up four point three percent of the assets under management. So why do we invest in it? Well, just a bit, a bit of a background. ICT um, is a global emerging market container port operator. Um, it currently operates in around 30, well, it currently has about 33 terminals and operates in about 20 countries globally. Um, it's listed on the Philippine Stock Exchange, even though revenues at the moment is out from the Philippines is around about 15, 20 percent um, because it's just grown that much. It now has much more of a, a global presence, but it's still listed in the Philippines where it originated from. It has a market cap of about 6.8 billion US dollar. And what attracts us to this stock is, you know, its valuation of uh, seven times EV EBITDA and um, a cash and, and a dividend yield of just shy of 4%. So why are we investors in ICT, though, you may ask? Well, as John and Charles have already mentioned, um, it um, has a number of long term concession agreements, which means that it can be quite monopolistic. The ports it operates are origin and destination ports, which mostly means imports and exports um, for that for the hinterlands around the area. So volumes tend to be relatively quite sticky. So as we're seeing, as Charles mentioned, the growth of the middle class growing consumption, volumes are naturally, or, you know, naturally improving through the ports, which we are able to then catalyze on. There has also been an increase in containerization within the port sector, i.e. Um, exporters and importers are wanting to put you know, goods into containers, i.e. those big boxes that you see on the motorway, for instance, when you're driving along um, into those container terminals, because it makes it much easier to handle the goods, it makes it quicker and more efficient at, at the port. But why do we really, really like ITT? It's the strong management team. They have shown us consistently over time how they are very operationally focused and how they're able to drive growth. You can see from the financials, um, on the bottom left hand corner, revenue has grown over the last four years. Um, well, revenue has grown about 34%, um, which has driven the EBITDA growth, which you can see there are 51%. And this has improved margins and the mar EBITDA margins has improved um, by 6.7%. As the port operator is able to catalyze an operational leverage, i.e. it's got quite good fixed costs so as volume comes through, it typically just falls to the bottom line. So each additional revenue line we get is falling straight through. And also because management have been absolutely scrupulous on ripping out costs for the business. So there's no XX costs. This, uh, this sort of uh, process that they have of uh, stripping out excess cost has also clearly been uh, shown in their ability to uh, acquire or do accretive acquisitions. ICT actually yesterday just announced that they've uh, acquired another port in Indonesia. And what this port is, it's another underperforming port asset. So they go in, basically strip out all excess cost and then basically drive growth through that port, which is very beneficial for us because it goes straight to the EBITDA and the EBITDA margin. So overall, ICT we like because it's a very well run port, cash generative asset. It's not expensive at seven times EV, but it's generating a solid yield for us. And over the last five years, we have seen a total shareholder return of over 110 percent. And it's a company in which we feel will be able to drive that growth going forward. I don't know, John, if you now want to talk about uh, another stock, Alapar, which is uh, number two in the portfolio. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Jax. Uh, so Alipar is a Brazilian transmission operator. So they have a portfolio of electricity transmission lines in Brazil. Uh, they also have a smaller hydro plant in Peru, and they have a transmission project in Colombia. But the vast majority of assets for the company are in Brazil. Um, majority of those are transmission lines, and they also have some hydro and wind assets in Brazil. And if you took their grid network of almost 8,000 kilometers, that's slightly larger than national grid in the UK, uh, to give you some concept of how large the company is. And 
What we really like about them is the combination of the quality of assets and the management team. So to give you an idea of the quality of the assets, a transmission line in Brazil will be a 30-year concession. It gets a, an annual inflation adjustment and it's a regulated revenues. And these are very stable assets. They typically have over 99% of uptime and they typically have very low OPEX. So again, this, this high operating leverage model. The risk around transmission is to do in the development stage. So when you're building the asset, you can have uh, cost overruns on construction, you can have environmental license issues, et cetera. And what we have with Alapar is a management team who are extremely good at executing projects. Um, we've known the company for nine years now, and we've been investors over that period. And if you just took the last five years as a snapshot, they've grown their network by over 50% during this period. So you've got real growth and it's organic growth that they've been generating. And the management team are investors in the company and they are very disciplined on capital. So if you take the auctions that happen annually for transmission projects in Brazil, they have lost out in every bid for the last five or six years because the returns in those bids have frankly been appalling. And actually we've seen operators go into distressed situations because they've overbid for these assets. The ones that they have won, they're making exceptional returns and their parameters were looking for say a 12% real return on their projects. But once they've bid and won at that 12% hurdle, they'll actually spend about on average 20% less capex developing the project. They'll typically build the project and bring it online up to 12 months early. So they get the extra year of income. And they've been very sophisticated about financing the projects and they've taken advantage of what were lower rates in Brazil and a lower inflation index to maximize returns. So if you look at the projects, the new ones, many new ones came on over the last 12, 18 months and will be rolling on over the next six months or so. This has delivered very strong growth. So EBITDA growth last year was 45%. Q1 this year was 35%. And you're going to get a substantial boost in yield again, because as these projects are now developed, they had to reduce their dividend to help fund that capital commitment. And now we expect that to return again. So dividend payout, which was 100%, was cut to 50%, will come back up to 100%. And we will see the benefit of that. So we've got great assets. We've got best in class management team and we have what is still a very cheap valuation. Alipar is trading on 10 times P, which is absurdly cheap for the quality of assets. Um, for comparison, again, with the UK comparison, National Grid is at 16 times. Mark, would you like to talk about FPT? Yeah, certainly. So FPT um, is a Vietnamese telecoms and IT services group, it services customers both domestically and internationally. At the end of June, it was our seventh largest holding within the portfolio. Now, the company actually is a group of a number of subsidiaries, and it groups these subsidiaries into three core areas. First one is technology, where it provides software solutions and IT services, both to Vietnamese institutions and the government, as the company looks to digitize itself, but also to large multi global multinationals, where it leverages its Vietnamese employee base to provide um, a cost-effective software solutions. FPT Telecom is one of the largest fiber broadband and internet service providers in Vietnam. It is also a leading data center operator, and this actually was what first caught our attention to the group. The company also has a third segment, which is the fastest growing segment, about 10% of revenues, um, which is called FPT Education. And this has become the largest private education company in Vietnam. 
It operates schools, technical colleges, and the university, as well as providing online training, very much of an IT services and business bias. In total, they had about 75,000 full-time equivalent students at the end of 2011. We first invested in FBT in early 2019, and Charles and I visited the company's Hanoi operations later that year. We were very impressed by the quality, strength, and ambition of the management team with their long-term strategic thinking, such as identifying the need to create a local talent pool through educational services and realizing that their 15 to 20% current staff cost advantage over, say, the Indian outsourcers may not be sustainable longer term, and they need to compete on the quality of their solutions and the productivity of their staff. We're also impressed by the quality of the company that they keep, if you like, with their partners, people like Oracle, Microsoft, and their customer base for FPT software. They've got a number of blue chip names. Some of them that are featured on their website as, as examples are listed on the presentation. So they initially were very strong in, in Japan, um, and they've got companies like Hitachi, Sony, Honda. They then expanded into continental Europe, particularly France and, and Germany. Um, but recently they've expanded very strongly in the US and it's probable that in the second half of this year, the US will become their biggest market. Um, revenues in the US in the first half of this year up 48%. Now the company has consistently um, reported a strong growth across all its three segments and the group revenues and EBITDA are growing at about 20% per annum. Guidance for this year is, is similar, about 20% growth. And we've just had first half numbers through showing that uh, first half revenues are up 22% and profit before tax was up 24%. We should also note at this stage that the Vietnamese dong is um, pegged pretty much uh, so, so, a soft peg to the US dollar. So it's depreciated about 1.6% over the last year compared to a movement of, of 12% appreciation on sterling and 14% appreciation on, on euros. So this is these are strong, uh, strong revenues. Um, we should also, I, I suppose, the other thing that was, that was said in, in the first half results is that the company has signed in its, its FPT international software unit, $500 million worth of contracts in the first six months of this year. And this is 40% up on the, the rate that they signed contracts uh, in the first half of last year. 77% of those contracts are more than, were for more than a million dollars. So this gives us great confidence in the company that the momentum of the business will continue. In terms of valuation, when we first invested, um, this was on a, a single digit PE, um, an AV of Hubert Daft in, in the mid single digits. As you can see from the share price, um, you know, this has, has probably trebled in price since we've, we've held the stock. And it's now on a valuation that's it's more in line with perhaps with international peers. It's still reasonable at about 10 times EV2, but are 20 times PE. And it does pay, although it's a growth business, it does pay a dividend. The dividend yield is about 2%. So that's a summary of FBT. I'll perhaps hand over now to Charles to give us a summary of, of UEM and, and prepare for questions. Thank you very much, guys. Um, and I hope that gives um, all all the, the viewers here an understanding of, of, of both, if you want, emerging markets, but also, uh, and what's driving them, but also what we are looking for in UEM and, and some of our investments. In summary, um, you know, just to leave you with some closing thoughts, um, you know, I, I, I always stress, we have cash generative operational businesses. Um, so they're up and running, and, and a lot of the risks is therefore removed. We have attractive valuations at the moment. Um, you know, I have been really surprised about how well these, these companies have performed through COVID um, and through the recent challenges since the invasion in, in Ukraine. Um, so the valuations are attractive. Um, we have strong management teams. I think you've probably heard from John Jackson, Mark, um, and you know I would just echo their views. The management teams behind these opportunities are are at times world class, um, and that's really pleasing to see. I think we offer you, in terms of the opportunity, a, a, a very specialised but very experienced management team, and I hope that's come through to you. In terms of uh, UEM, you know, the portfolio is differentiated, as John noted. 
Um, we have a covered dividend, which again, I think is an attractive feature, especially in these markets. Um, and we're trading at over a 10% discount for uh, new investors buying shares on the market. So I think that combination of quality of assets, quality of management, quality of cash flow, um, give us high conviction looking forward. So thank you very much. Um, we'll now turn to questions. Fantastic, Charles. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to the team for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of the screen. But just while the team take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. We did receive um, a pre-submitted question um, ahead of today's event. Charles, perhaps if I could address this to you, it, it sort of forms several parts, but um, it reads as follows. What's the average P ratio of the portfolio? What's just been the evolution of the PE ratio over the last few years? What's the average earnings growth of the portfolio and the average dividend growth of the portfolio companies? So, Paul, thank you for the question. And it, it, it's, all, it's one that we do get regularly. Um, the challenge we have is because we're bottom-up investors, the portfolio itself does shift. Um, so if you went back almost to the inception, I think Brazil was around 33%. Um, and through the last 15 years, um, at one point, Brazil was down at 12. We'd, we'd, we'd seen a number of investments materialize and exit. Um, on, the other, on the other side, you could see Vietnam starting as a low percentage, but today is a reasonably high percentage of the portfolio. And what I'm leading up to is the markets have different valuation metrics. So, so you'll find that, you know, the Latin American markets in particular pay a high yield. The Asian markets pay a low uh, yield. So trying to give uh, a, a steer on this is actually quite difficult and I, I, I think would be misleading. I still think the best comment we can make is if you looked at the portfolio today, RP is just over 11 versus the MSCI, which is just over 13. Um, but I would I would say that you know you do need to then drill down and look at companies and 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 look at the markets you're in. If you looked at dividend growth last year, um, dividend growth was about 11 percent. So you know that's perfectly good uh, a return I think. And if you looked at EBITDA growth over the last four years, so taking into account if you want COVID um, and trying to look at how did this pool of assets performed, they've delivered roughly 9% per annum in EBITDA. So an attractive portfolio, um, but not one that we can sort of easily um, look to and try and uh, give an answer on price earnings ratio, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope that answers the question. That's fantastic, Charles. Thank you very much indeed. Um, as you can see, we have received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. Thank you to all the investors for submitting those. Jacqueline, if I may, perhaps just ask uh, you, where appropriate to do so, just to read out those questions and direct them to the team, please. Yeah, the first question that's come in is uh, effectively about our investment approach, I suppose. Um, John or Charles, um, I don't know which one of you would like to answer this, but basically with a large universe universe of potential investments, how do we filter down how do we filter down to our targets to deliver on the strategy and what metrics do we look for? So I'm happy to answer the question, Jax. I think um, the way I look at it is a competition. Um, so John, Jax and Mark are focused on, if you want, their subsets. Um, but it's a competition to get into the portfolio. So if an idea comes up, first of all, something has to go out because we're a closed-end fund. Um, so, so it's got to um, offer us something that we don't already have. Um, Sometimes that can be diversity in terms of geography. Sometimes it can be diversity in terms of if you want a particular asset um, opportunity that we just don't have too much of in the portfolio. So for some, you know, from time to time, um, stock exchanges have come in and played a reasonable part in the portfolio or satellites have come in and paid a reasonable part in the portfolio. So it's a competition to get in. Um, we're looking for what I would call a, 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 a total return over five years. Um, 
the team builds models um, which enables us to bring all the opportunities onto a similar footing um, so we don't rely on broker's notes we don't rely on if you want m m management information we we build our own models, we develop our own expectations, and we have a robust debate. Um, and if an, a, an investment is approved, um, then we'll make it. And I suppose leading on from that, Charles, uh, a nice question, or uh, I'll amalgamate two questions together that we've got about how our investment approach is sort of driving our sort of investment choices. But, you know, how active have we been, though, uh, investing in unquoted? Um, and uh, what proportion? Uh, what has been the performance of the unquoted? So I would say the unquoted is uh, at times we've used it where we, we can see a particular opportunity that doesn't fit within um, uh, 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 or, or, or gives us access to something that, that doesn't necessarily fit within the portfolio. Um, it's not something that we seek out. Um, I think we're very conscious as the size management team that we don't want uh, too many distractions and unlisters can give you distractions. Um, but for instance, I mean, John can talk about a wind farm that we invested in mainland China. Yeah, so you'll see this in the top 30 under uh, UM Hong Kong uh, is a holding company. It's an SPV that we set up so that we could invest in an onshore private equity fund which was developing wind and solar assets onshore mainland china and this is cgn fund three and what this vehicle enabled us to do was to tap in direct investments in projects in renewable projects in china rather than going through the listed space which was predominantly soe uh, so for us it was a very interesting approach to try and improve our returns to have a, a seat at the table directly um, and they are in the process now of exiting uh, they've agreed a sale of the assets that they've developed over the last five years with SEMCOR in Singapore and so we will see a good return on those assets and we're starting to get the cash back from that investment uh, this year, we we had the first $1.3 million come back uh, just last month. Um, so it's giving us access to something which is slightly different from what we can access through the listed market. And that really was the attraction. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, also, I think, uh, John, you did mention also about small and mid caps. Uh, do we have any liquidity constraints in positions we can take? So we are pretty nimble. We can go down to relatively small uh, market caps and, and certainly well below the thresholds that the uh, larger funds might look at and below the threshold that you would typically see in uh, MSCI Emerging Markets Index. Um, we would prefer not to go so low into those situations where the liquidity is so poor that we would effectively be trapped in a position. Um, but certainly we would be comfortable taking a position in companies where the liquidity is low, but we can see the opportunity and we have the time horizon to deliver the return. Um, so Alipar actually is an example of this. Alipar was, at one and a half billion dollars now, but it was below a billion dollars market cap. And so was with that's a typical cutoff for many emerging markets funds. So it just wouldn't have been on their radar. And we were investing well before that. Okay, thanks, John. Um, one question we've also got in apparently uh, it says, I noticed a Russian holding in the top 20. Um, I'm happy to take this this question. Uh, please comment on this holding. We, we, we don't have any exposure to Russia actually um, in, in the portfolio. Uh, we did have one position going into sort of the Russian-Ukraine war. As soon as the situation sort of material or sort of escalated, um, we sold down that position, which is always, always less than 1% of our total assets under manager anyway, to 60%. And the remaining bit of uh, the investment we uh, actually then um, 
uh, wrote it or we've written it down to zero effectively. Um, we've never had much exposure to, to Russia, um, primarily just because, as, as I mentioned, I think in portfolio construction, the political, the political uh, risk there for us has always been um, very, well, the political risk has always been very high and therefore the, the, that market has been very challenging and something which we've never really wanted to have too much um, exposure to. Um, another question, a bit more on the macro side here. Um, there's a big election uh, coming up in Brazil in October. Um, how could this affect uh, our investment holdings there? Um, John, I don't know if you want to answer to answer that one. Yeah, happy to. Um, election cycles in emerging markets uh, are very frequent occurrences and they are often volatile periods and they do make a challenging investment environment. Um, in Brazil, uh, in October, we have elections which include the presidential election. Um, a year ago, uh, we were looking at this forthcoming election with some concern, and we were actively looking at managing our exposure to Brazil down ahead of the election due to that uncertainty. What has subsequently happened in the past six months is that the, the presidential race has really refined down to two candidates, uh, Bolsonaro, who's the current president, and Lula, who is a former president. Now, both of those are known quantities. And so what we've, what we've done is had to reverse our opinion in some ways, because what was going to be a very uncertain outcome is now quite a known outcome, because we know how both those politicians act. They are both populists. They both have their own uh, particular angles on economic um, sort of interference, if you like, and uh, how they'll manage Senate and relationships, how noisy they are on Twitter. But we understand that. And so we're, we're quite comfortable with both of those being known quantities. And so relating to our holding specifically we don't expect there to be a material challenge to the frameworks in which our companies operate neither the candidates have actively sought to manage regulatory environments and something that we've seen in argentina as an example and so from our asset base perspective we don't see a material consequence of the election. Um, from a broader macro picture, um, the fiscal deficit uh, has been a topic which both candidates are um, can have have been a bit relaxed over, um, and the fiscal rule has been a question, and that has been reflected in currencies, and so that's something which we would see more of an influence on in regards to our portfolio exposure. Okay, thanks, John. Um, slightly conscious of time, but uh, we've got a few more questions in. One question is uh, about skin in the game. Um, it's very topical at the moment in the investment fund world. Um, Charles, probably one for you. What are the holdings of, manager, of the manager and the directors in UEM? How much skin in the game have we got? So I haven't gone and looked at the absolute number for the directors, but I'm sure somebody else can help me on the call. But, you know, we, we have a policy whereby the directors take their fees in shares. Um, so over time, they have built up a, a, a good position in UEM and obviously will continue to do so going forward. I think as managers, um, you know, we have a substantial investment in the portfolio. I hold over 400,000 shares. Um, and if we look at UIL, which is a, another investment company, we manage they own roughly 14% of UEM. So we're, we are laser focused on, if you want the performance as shareholders of UEM. And I think again, this does bring us a, you know, a sharper focus on, on ensuring um, that we sustain a, a, a performance going forward. Okay, thank you, Charles. Um, we can get back to um, the person, the director, director holding. That's not a problem. We will answer that offline. Um, 
Another question quickly uh, is, which question we were asked quite a few times, is how do we deal with emerging market currency weakness and fluctuation? Um, Charles, I'm not sure if you would like to take that one as well. So I think what, one of the areas that we have, if you want, um, shied away from is trying to look at, um, if you want, currencies and, 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 and and, and hedging, it's particularly expensive. Um, I also think we're not well set um, to manage it. Um, so we have no currency hedges in place. Um, what we do do is where we borrow funds, we will try and borrow in a currency that we think offsets part of the portfolio and may represent um, a hedge of sorts. So at the moment, our borrowings are in Euro. Um, and we've got a number of Eastern European investments. So there is some mitigation there, but you know, we, we run a, a portfolio and are currency agnostic. Over time, I think it, it'll, it'll average out. Um, and I think that's our approach. Okay, thanks Charles. Uh, and I think we've only got one final question, uh, which is given the emerging market, we are an emerging market focused fund, are companies listed in developed markets, but holding a significant percentage of assets in emerging markets, also part of our investment universe? Um, Charles, would you like to take that on as well? Very, very happy to answer that question. <laughs> it, yes, we will, uh, we will look for um, and invest in companies um, wherever they're listed, be they, as long as if you want, they're operating in Brazil. If they're listed in London, we'll invest in them. If they're listed in New York, we'll invest in them. Um, the thing I would note is on occasion, you do see a number of listings emerging in a, in a jurisdiction. Um, and I'm always weary as to why are you not listing in your home market? So I like to understand what, why it's not listing in its home market. But yes, we hold investments listed on other stock exchanges operating in the emerging markets. Okay, brilliant. That's fantastic, I think, Jacqueline. I was going to say, you've covered off everything. Yeah. So thank you very much Earthly indeed. Thank time. you to the team for, for covering those. And yeah, right on the button. That's wonderful. Um, Charles, perhaps for redirecting investors to give you their feedback, which I know is particularly important to you and the team, just a, a final closing couple of comments, please. Well, look, I think it's no doubt a challenging time in, in, in the wider markets and it is no doubt a challenging time globally. Um, but I think if you just look at the weight of growth that everybody's expecting in the emerging markets, especially in the middle class, it ought to drive a real opportunity. Um, and I think UEM is well positioned to capture that growth. So That's hopefully fantastic. those that are not investors become investors. Fantastic. Thank Charles, you. Thank you. Thank you very much to you and the team. Um, can I please ask investors not to close the section and you should be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order the team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete. I'm sure it's greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Utilico Emerging Markets Trust PLC, thank you for attending today's session. <laughs>